Welcome to the Science Area of Knowledge uh, presentation from Mr. Midgley. I trust you're all well and safe and looking after each other and we'll crack on. So um, obviously you, some of you do science or all of you do science actually and uh, depends, depends which one you do. You probably have your own perceptions of how science ought to be done, ought to be told, ought to be sold, ought to be hold, any of those things. It's up to you. You have your own point of view and we respect that. Um, scientists are exactly the same. We're all human beings. Uh, we communicate in a, a common language, which we'll explore a little bit during this presentation. Um, here is one of my, uh, one of my favorite uh, speakers, sadly no longer with us. Um, and he says, my own view is that this planet is used as a penal colony, a lunatic asylum and dumping ground by a superior civilization to get rid of the undesirable and the unfit. I can't prove it, but you can't disprove it either. What is he saying? Well, what he's saying is obviously some um, friction between science and religion. Um, some will say there isn't. I will say that there is. I, am res I respect my viewpoints, I respect yours, okay? Uh, this is a conjecture, this is an extrapolation of the idea that there is a teapot circling around Mars or orbiting around Mars, I should say. You cannot deny that the teapot is there. You cannot prove that the teapot is there because our technology is not sophisticated enough to detect a teapot orbiting around Mars. It doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means you can't prove it. And the notion of proof and the idea of proof is hopefully gonna be a central thread as we go through this presentation. So on that beautiful little bombshell, I hope you enjoyed that clip. It uh, always makes me smile. Um, Lisa had a, a theory and uh, her theory was based on the idea that mum's salad dressing would somehow quench the uh, lesser savoury elements of the bullying uh, person in the cage. OK, so let's start with what, what is natural science? Uh, natural sciences are the things that we call physics and chemistry and geology, biology, etc. Um, the, the lines between all those are blurred. The, uh, the most uh, important science going on right now today, arguably, is neither physics, nor chemistry, nor geology, nor biology, nor any of these little compartments that we have put our science into. It's in the nooks and the crannies and the crevices between those words where we are finding the most uh, advantage to us as the human species. We could say it's just the thing that deals with the physical world and the physical world um, is everything that we can sense, which we'll come to shortly, the role of sense in perception of the world. Um, it is not by definition, um, just taking this from a dictionary, don't blame me. It's not technology or psychology or computing. So in terms of the knowledge framework, I'm sure that's what you were all thinking about as uh, wonderfully successful IB students right now. Just take a second to reflect to you personally are the natural sciences of any importance? Did you choose not the path of the chemist or the physicist? Then that's quite, that's quite fine. Uh, we, we all have a, a deck of cards that we're trying to play to our best of our abilities. Um, so why is it important to, to people? Well, I'm sure the obvious things will, will come true uh, or hold true. And these things are obviously transport or food or the lights in your room, your cell phone, that's quite an old image there, um, and obviously medicines and drugs. Um, as you all know, there are roughly, uh, what, 7 billion people on the planet right now. And in every one of those people, 40% of the nitrogen in their amino acids would not be there if it were not for the harbor process. If you've forgotten a bit of your GCSE chem, the harbour process is synthesising ammonia, which is NH3, lone pair of electrons chemist, from nitrogen and hydrogen using an iron catalyst. Why is ammonia important? Ammonia is important for two reasons. Reason one, it makes fertilisers in the form of ammonium nitrate or phosphate uh, spread on the land so we can uh, grow crops on a much grander, bigger scale than we would do with just uh, the soil without the uh, fertilisers, I assume. And hence, all of the produce you see now would not be there if it were not for modern farming. In fact, we could probably not support more than a billion people on the planet, I would hazard a guess. That's uh, inductive reasoning, we'll come to that shortly, if it were not for chemical processes. 
our life expectancy would not be somewhere in the high 70s, depending on uh, your where you were born, what you do, do during your life. Around 70 to 70 plus years old is kind of the average life expectancy now. Why is it so high? It's so high because A, we can eat, B, we can treat disease, C, we have sanitation. All of these are thanks to science. Ben Franklin, electricity in the 1700s. Alessandro Volta's first battery. Think of all the things that use a battery. I've got two daughters. They've got toys coming out of their playroom full of, of batteries. And of course, that's an electrochemical reaction, which I've not bored them with yet, but we'll get to that someday. Plastics, look around you now, look around the room, look around where you are sat. How many plastics can you see? You can see polyethene, polypropene, polyvinyl chloride. Um, they, they absolutely permeate every aspect of our lives. Without plastics, where would we be right now? You might immediately think, well, without plastics, we'd have no landfill and we'd have uh, no toxic fumes going into the air when we, we burn it. And both of those things are entirely true. But without plastics, we wouldn't have cheap transport. Without plastics, we wouldn't have affordable kitchenware. Without plastics, you fill in the rest of that. Modern agriculture. Uh, I've just mentioned about the, the harbour process. And of course, which is very um, potent at the moment, uh, our little quarantinis, is that the uh, role of modern medicine and uh, antibiotics. Antibiotics won World War I, basically, the side with the antibiotics and could cure their soldiers of their infections that they got in the trenches and send them off back to fight. Antibiotics won that little war there. Uh, Edward Jenner, vaccination, the role of vaccination. Um, right now, we're in the middle of a, a pandemic, a global pandemic, and companies are racing right now to find the vaccine or to find a cure for uh, what is turning out to be uh, a massive moment in the history of humankind on planet Earth. So hopefully you can see that science has been of some benefit to your beautiful self. So which ways of knowing do we use to understand the natural world? How affected are you by the natural sciences? We look at the natural world through the, the role of the, the senses, uh, intuition. Um, you could say we have a bit of faith in terms of um, our hope for what the experimental outcome might be. And that just doesn't apply only to internal assessments. That applies to people doing uh, deep research in universities. Quotes I like about science. It is to link the internal mind with the perceived world. Perhaps we exist for that. What a lofty, beautiful ambition. Um, do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted was once eccentric. Think of uh, when people used to think that the Earth was the centre of the universe and then, oh no, it can't be because uh, well, look, there's a sun there and we, we're going around the sun and the Earth's spinning around, so the sun must be the centre of the universe. And, and as time has gone on, as technology has improved... Now we've got the, the Hubble Space Telescope looking into deep space and looking back in time, all those wonderful, beautiful things. And that brings us on beautifully onto Einstein. The most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. Science does seem very F equals MA, or potential energy is MGH, or Q equals MC delta T. The lists, the lists, they go on. But the mysterious, that is the source of all true art and science from the uh, very famous Mr. Einstein. So what does make a method scientific? Um, there are many um, what I would reference as non-scientific uh, bodies of knowledge, but they assert that they are. So that is just my voice against theirs. Um, there is the Flat Earth Society. Yes, people uh, are members of this thing. Uh, people go and investigate paranormal activities. There, there is a chap in the US who sat with a million dollars since the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. And he sat there waiting and said, he'll give a million dollars to the first person that can prove that paranormalism, if that's a word, you know what I mean, actually exists. No one has yet claimed that prize. UFOlogy, again, UFOs, they pop up on a fairly frequent basis. Phrenology, that's um, looking at someone's skull or feeling the bumps in someone's skull and 
deducing their personality from it, which I suggest is of the same magnitude of um, stupidity is too strong a word, but it's getting close there to crystal healing and my, my pet hate uh, creation science. Do you all remember Bill Nye? Bill Nye, let's see him in action. We're seeing people in, in being indoctrinated to believe that creationists can't be scientists. There's experimental or observational science, as we call it. That's using the scientific method, observation, measurement, experiment, testing. All scientists, whether creationists or evolutionists, actually have the same observational or experimental science. Uh, Mr. Ham and his followers have this remarkable view of uh, a worldwide flood that somehow influenced everything that we observe in nature. A 500-foot wooden boat, eight zookeepers for 14,000 individual animals, every land plant in the world underwater for a full year. I ask us all, is that really reasonable? You'll hear a lot about the Grand Canyon, I imagine, also, which is a remarkable place, and it has fossils. And the fossils in the Grand Canyon are found in layers. There is not a single place in the Grand Canyon where the fossils of one type of animal cross over into the fossils of another. In other words, when there was a big flood on the Earth, you would expect drowning animals to swim up to a higher level. Not any one of them did. If Bill Nye and I went to the Grand Canyon, we could agree that that's a Coconino sandstone in the Hermit Shale, and there's the boundary. They're sitting one on top of the other. We could agree on that, but we would disagree on how long it took to get there. But see, none of us saw the sandstone or the shale being laid down. There's a supposed 10 million year gap there, but I don't see a gap. But that might be different to what Bill and I would see. But, but see, there's a difference between what you actually observe directly and then your interpretation in regard to the past. We're, we're talking about the past when we weren't there. We didn't see those tree rings actually forming. We didn't see those layers being laid down. It's like the dating methods. You're assuming things in regard to the past uh, that aren't necessarily true. The fundamental thing we disagree on, Mr. Ham, is this nature of what you can prove to yourself. When people make assumptions, they're making assumptions based on previous experience. They're not coming out of whole cloth. I encourage you to explain to us why, why we should accept your word for it, that natural law changed just 4,000 years ago completely, and there's no record of it. Natural law hasn't changed, as I talked about. You know, we, I said we have the laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, and that only makes sense within a biblical worldview anyway of a creator God who set up those laws, and that's why we can do good experimental science, because we assume those laws are true and they'll be, they'll be true uh, tomorrow. We build models based upon the Bible, and those models are always subject to change. The fact of Noah's flood is not subject to change. The, the model of how the flood occurred is subject to change, uh, because we, we observe in the, in the, in the current world and, and we're able to uh, come up with maybe different ways this could have happened or that could have happened and, and that's part of that scientific discovery. You cannot ever prove using uh, you know, the, the scientific method in the present, you can't prove the age of the earth. So you can never prove it's old. So there is no hypothetical. <laughs> what we want in science, <laughs> science as practiced out on the outside, is an ability to predict. We want to have a natural law that is so obvious and clear, so well understood, that we can make predictions about what will happen. And the big thing I want from you, Mr. Han, is can you come up with something that you can predict? Do you have a creation model that predicts something that will happen in nature? So the role of science is, as a predictor, is what Bill, Bill Nye, that, that chap you've been listening to for many years, I'm sure, in your science lessons, he's saying that science, uh, its purpose, its role in the world is to predict. And you might be thinking of, uh, I don't know, the, the theory of gravity. The theory of gravity is great. Every time I drop a cup, it falls to the floor and smashes. Um, every time I throw a ball, it misses the hoop and it lands on the court. Um, the lists are endless. But gravity is only given the status of theory. So this is the role of language and status within science. So it's only a theory. But the word theory in science means something different than the word theory in the vernacular or in the, the everyday world. You might have a theory that, um, I don't know, COVID virus might end by May. That'd be great. There's a theory. It's testable. 
We'll find out, I'm sure. Um, but what we need to get there is we need a method. And the best way to learn a method is with a song. <laughs> so the scientific method it has given us uh, wonderful results in many occasions. We also have got many wonderful results just by the role of serendipity. Serendipity is the role of luck or chance and chance discoveries have done and led to the biggest blockbuster uh, drugs, medicines that the, uh, the world of humanity has ever seen. So the problems with scientific method, it relies on the senses. You probably did at the start of your TOK course, the uh, optical illusions, the auditory illusions, what you heard, what you saw, a difference, what's actually present. The, the, the sense, the touches, uh, problems that you get when you, you use a pin and you close your eyes and you can't see where it's gone and you confuse which part of your arm it's, it's going into. I don't think that's legal anymore, but that's what we used to do. Okay, it relies on language. You know, you know, language, the, the language of science is predominantly, this is changing quite rapidly, is predominantly English. So what's wrong with this statement? What's wrong with saying the strongest wind ever was 408 kilometres per hour? Well, clearly, ever, how long is ever? If you ask a creationist, it's 4,000 years. Um, if you ask a scientist, it's uh, about going on for seven billion, six to seven billion years. Um, we've not been around. If you condense the history of the Earth into 24 hours, so let's say the, the Earth came into existence at uh, zero, 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 one second. So one minute's past midnight. And humanity, well, humanity, what time did they rock up? Um, it was certainly well into the afternoon before you even got the first plants. Um, early evening, you're going to get the first single-celled amoebas. Probably around 9, 10 o'clock, you're going to get dinosaurs. 11 o'clock, you're going to get mammals. And it was in the last bit, the, the history of the Earth was condensed to 24 hours. Humanity has only been on this planet for around about two seconds. Just think of that for a second. There was two seconds. That's how long humanity has been here if you condense the history of the Earth into 24 hours. So there's no way you can state that. The other problems, what the, the, the observations that you make and the choices that you make of the conclusion from the observation. Look at the tobacco industry. You can find old advertising for tobacco saying doctors suggest that camel lights are going to make you breathe more easily or these will make you more beautiful or more attractive uh, to your intended partner. Look at the role of thalidomide. Thalidomide was a great cure for morning sickness. It also produced teratogenic birth defects. That means that the kids were born with limbs missing. And uh, that's now going on to second, third, fourth generation uh, because it actually mutates the DNA. They knew this, they withheld it, but yet they still marketed it. The beauty industry, the beauty industry is held up as, as, as an industry that sells, uh, it doesn't sell cosmetics, it sells hope. Logic is based on deductive and inductive reasoning. Your teacher will share this presentation with you and you will find this little test on deductive reasoning. You need to know the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning. So first of all, deductive reasoning. Okay, so it's deductive reasoning is used in science. Uh, it's a valid form of reasoning. Uh, it starts with a general statement or a hypothesis, examines the possibilities, 
So you can make a theory and you're going to look at prediction. What Bill Nye was talking about, can it predict what's going to happen? So usually it follows some steps. Um, an example could be all men are mortal. Harold is a man. Therefore, Harold is a mortal. So for deductive reasoning to be sound, the hypothesis must be correct. And it is assumed that the premises, all men are mortal and Harold is a man, are true. So we have to form, assume some truism to the original hypothesis. Um, I hope you enjoy doing that, that little quiz. It, it will fry your brain for quite some time. Um, <laughs> in inductive inference, uh, we go from the specific to the general. So we'll make observations, discern a pattern, make a generalisation and infer an explanation. So we could say, the coin I pulled from the bag is a penny. That coin is a penny. That means the next coin I pull out of the bag will also be a penny. These are all problems with the method. First of all, relying on our perception. Second of all, the role of the observer in the observation of what's being done or what's, what's, what's actually happened. And then the actual use of the two forms, deductive and inductive reasoning in reaching conclusion are also flawed. Because induction does not give us certainty. The penny from the bag, the next penny from the bag might not be a penny, it might be a dollar. But certainty is what the scientific method craves. So using deductive reasoning, and deductive reasoning is one of the central tenets of the scientific method. So the scientific method demands some certainty. But inductive logic, the penny, the penny, can never be certain. Therefore, the scientific method cannot use inductive logic. So by its own um, philosophy, it defeats itself because the scientific method is, of course, flawed. So how do we solve this? Well, we could just say it works. Brilliant, it works. <laughs> Medicines work. Uh, but this is wrong because we're, not, we're using inductive argument to prove induction. That's like using your own... You can't taste your own tongue. We could use probabilism. It's probable. We'll just say, uh, yeah, it's probably likely. That, that will do. That will do. But it's not, it's not enough, is it? It's not enough. Oh, we just stick our head in the sand and deny it and just say that the scientific method is rubbish and therefore we'll ignore it. A more rational and perhaps intelligent uh, take on the problems with the scientific method is devised by two philosophers. One is Karl Popper, one is Thomas Kuhn. And Karl Popper avoids induction like this. It begins with an idea, not an observation. So it's very much he sat in the armchair uh, looking at the world and coming up with an idea. Make it, call it a hypothesis if you want. But critically, what Popper says, you try to prove it wrong. If you can't prove it wrong, then it's likely to be probable. So this, is, this removes the problem of uh, certainty because we're looking at probability. Okay, So it's, it's, the, it's the null hypothesis, which you're all familiar with. This came from this chap, Karl Popper. I suggest you look him up. So... You know, um, how many of you actually read your star signs in the morning? I read mine and it said, I'm a Gemini, whatever that means. It says that I'm gentle, affectionate, curious, adaptable. I can learn quickly and exchange ideas. It says that I like music and books and magazines. <laughs> and I dislike being alone, being confined, repetition and routine. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. But why is that not scientific? What did Karl Popper just say? We should make a theory and try and prove it wrong. My star sign could say, you are going to fall in love with a, a man in a red car today. That is not scientific for this reason. The reason is, it doesn't prohibit me from not falling in love with a man in a red car. It predicts that I will, it doesn't prohibit me from not. And the prohibition from not is the test of the theory. That's what Karl Popper is saying. Thomas Kuhn, we also said, Thomas Kuhn talks about paradigms, the paradigms of science, that there are revolutions, little revolutions. There is normal science, normal science. Think of the old theories like we did at the beginning, like phrenology, like you can uh, read someone's skull by the power of touch. And uh, then we realise that perhaps that's not the best way to go. So there's a crisis 
and then there's a revolution, there's a paradigm change, and maybe uh, I don't know, NLP, neuro linguistic programming, is a more sophisticated method to actually uh, study uh, psychology of people. What do all these molecules have in common? I'll give you some names. The one on the top left is uh, penicillin, or it's a penicillin variant. The one at the bottom is uh, platin, which is one of the top anti-cancer drugs on the planet. And the one on the right is, I think that's LSD. What do they all have in common? Well, the fantastically interesting molecules. Look at the beauty of those, wow. None of them were found by deductive or inductive reasoning or the scientific method. And yet the one on the top left, the antibiotics, the one at the bottom, the cancer drug, and the one on the right, that dubious uses, but there might be some in the future. Um, they were all found by complete chance, by luck, by serendipity. So while we worry completely about the nature of science and how science evolves and develops its theories and proofs and theorems, really, when we threw two chemicals down a sink, it changed colour. We had a look at it, we were like, wow, look at that. Never forget that serendipity always has a role. So which area of knowledge has justification without any observation? I'll let you answer that question. So I'll leave you today. Hope you've enjoyed that little whistle stop tour. Uh, science as an area of knowledge with one of my personal heroes, also sadly passed now, is Mr. Hawking. And finally tonight, we had a rare chance to catch up with a man whose mind has been ranked with Einstein and Newton. Stephen Hawking was honored recently at the World Science Festival. His daily life is constricted by Lou Gehrig's disease, but his horizon is as vast as the universe he explores. 68-year-old Stephen Hawking, physicist, father, philosopher. Body so disabled by ALS, he has the control of only one muscle in his right cheek, which twitches to become his voice, his daughter Lucy. Every single word comes from a movement of a cheek muscle, a very tiny specific muscular movement that requires extreme dedication and commitment. Each twitch moves a cursor to a letter or number or pre-existing word. And because he can only type one to two words a minute, we told him what we wanted to ask beforehand. His words are then read by a computerized voice. He was 21 years old, a university student, when suddenly he started falling for no apparent reason. With the diagnosis ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, he said he felt he faced an execution. But then, racing against the clock, he turned to his work. He married twice, had three children, and outlived the prognosis by 43 years, treating every single day as a chance to ask a new question. If the universe gave you a giant gift tomorrow, an answer, what's the answer you'd most want? I want to know why the universe exists, why there is something rather than nothing. Hawking has said he believes in the creative majesty of scientific law, not a personal god for humans. When you look at the vast size of the universe, and how insignificant an accidental human life is in it, that seems most implausible. And it doesn't seem to make you sad ever that we are so insignificant in the universe. There is a fundamental difference between religion, which is based on authority, and science, which is based on observation and reason. Science will win, because it works. Recently, in a Discovery Channel series, he made news saying somewhere in the universe there must be other living things. He even dreamed of their possible shapes and sizes, but warned. They may not be so friendly. And then in 2007, he got to experience the wonder of flying in space himself in a zero-gravity airplane. Finally, his own body, no burden. Then, back to Earth. And his three children, three grandchildren, who say he may have taught the world about black holes and gravity, but he taught them about daily courage and infinite kindness. And then what do you say to your children? What, what is the best fatherly advice that you give them? Here are the most important pieces of advice that I've passed on to my children. One, remember to look up at the stars and not down at your feet. Two, never give up work. Work gives you meaning and purpose and life is empty without it. It's beautiful advice. Three, if you are lucky enough to find love, 
Remember it is rare, and don't throw it away. Lucky children to have you. It was tiring, time for him to go. I think my parents' most important advice was comb your hair in the back and not just the front. <laughs> but that, again, that's another very useful piece of advice. <laughs> because if you think about it, if you spent all your time looking at, the looking at the stars and never looked at your feet, you would actually walk into some lampposts. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But you'd raise your sights. You would raise your sights. I think that's what he's saying. Stephen Hawking once said, God not only plays dice with the world, but sometimes throws the dice where they can't be seen reminding us it's the glory of being human to set out in search of the mystery. The remarkable Stephen Hawking. Right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope there was some food for thoughts. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, best of luck in your studies. Um, and I hope you all stay safe and healthy at this, uh, this time. Okay? Best wishes to you all. Thanks for listening.